So, so tell me about, tell me about writing music. When you sit down, do you kind of go into, um, into a dark lab and, and find your inner soul and write, or do you just, Hey, this hit me right here. I'm going to write a little bit about it. Well, there's a formula to writing, Frank. You know, when you sing a lot of top 40, you know, I remember coming up, uh, even in high school, and, and uh, you'd have to do a lot of what they call top 40 gigs, man. When the disco era was happening, like you are the sunshine of my life, or then the rock area, my baby loves the hanky-panky, and you find out that there's a formula to writing. And the formula is usually a fir- uh, intro, first verse, chorus, second verse, either chorus or going to a bridge, mm-hmm. third verse or two choruses and out. I mean, there is a formula that's a mathematical formula to writing. Whether you go to the one, the four, the three, the five, there are, it's all, uh, music is all mathematics, but uh, I usually write uh, the chorus first, because hmm. the song usually dr- r- r- revolves around the chorus, whether it be a Take Me Home Tonight or I've Got Two Tickets to Paradise, right. Baby Hold On, it's all, right. it's all pretty much in the chorus. A lot of people uh, don't write like that, but that's just how I've always written. So you became a, uh, a writer of music because you were so good at math? <laughs> no, I was terrible at math. I, <laughs> I failed algebra three times. but <laughs> Only three times? But at I least was, you knew the number. But, but I was very good at, it, at English. I was an English major, so there you go. Well, did you read a lot, did you? Yes, I read a lot in high school. Yeah. You, I had to read in high school. You, know, you yeah. had to read the classics and everything else like that, of course. Yeah. We all read the classic comics to write our book reports, but no, I, I read I read a fair amount in high school. Yeah, I majored in English, and then I went to uh, I went to college, and I majored in English and minored in music. Really? Yeah. So, what are some of the what are some of the classic books that you kind of went, wow, this this person sat down and wrote with their entire well, heart? You know, something like A Tale of Two Cities, which was amazing, or. Uh, the diary, of, uh, the diary of Anne Frank was another great book. Mm. I mean, there's a lot of yeah. great books. So, I'm reading a book right now about uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest, The Wizard in the Saddle. I'm a, oh. I'm kind of a buff on s- s- the Civil War. You know, oh, really? So I like, yeah, I'm into that. But you don't do reenactments? No, I don't. I don't get out there. <laughs> I have a friend who does reenactments, and I go. I mean, I, yeah, everything. It everything, looks like a lot of fun to tell you the truth. You honestly, know? it looks interesting to me. I'll say interesting as opposed to fun because sometimes it'll be eighty degrees, and then we're in the big walls. Sure, yeah. And I'm kind of like, dude, I understand you. They get to fire those old guns, so that's a lot of fun, you know. <laughs> but I mean, they're all over the they're all over the country. Yeah, so that's very true. Someday, which which side would you? Uh, would I have you go to pick on? the South because my wife is from the South. Oh, and nothing to do with owning slaves or anything else like that. I just think the southern people were. Why were they fighting the northerners? Because they were down there. That's why. That's <laughs> right. Well, if it did have to do with slavery, and that's why you chose it, that would be. This would be a whole other conversation, wouldn't no, it? No, no. I've got an awful lot of great black friends to tell you the truth. And I think right, the birth of rock and roll. Yeah, came from people like you know Fat Domino and Little Richard and Muddy Waters and some fantastic people. Yeah, I saw uh, I saw BB King once, and I just went, "Wow!" Yeah, with Lucille, and he was probably what eighty then. I mean, eighty. He's had so many girlfriends in his life. You think he's got more grandchildren than anybody in the country? <laughs> and he t- and God bless him, he takes care of all of them. Well, then that's then that's what it's worth, right? Yeah. That's I'm a, good a big BB King fan. Believe me, the yeah. thrill is gone. <laughs> <laughs> So, well, let's go to two tickets since you mentioned it. I, I really thought, as you know, it's okay, it's a great big hit for you, but I thought there was a really cool message in that about going out and searching for, just getting the heck out of town, if you will. Well, you know, i tell you the truth. When I, I was going with a girl with Alpha Fee when I was going to UC Berkeley, I, I kind of worked my way through college. I worked as a bell-bottom salesman back on Telegraph Avenue in Berkeley, and I worked as a receiving clerk in J.C. Penney's. I really didn't have a lot of money and since I quit the police department. Really? My parents weren't going to put me through college, and I was an out-of-state student. But I was dating a girl that was a really big sorority, and her mother would do everything in the world to get her away from me on the weekends <laughs> so she could meet a nice young lawyer or a young doctor or a CPA. <laughs> and I actually wrote Two Tickets to Paradise about taking a bus ride through the Redwoods, the California Redwoods. Really? Yeah. Because I was up there uh, going to court in Arcadia, which is in Northern California, yep. for something that I was holding that wasn't mine, but we won't get into that because right. the students did cut me loose. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I was I wanted to take her on a bus ride up to the Redwoods. And I tell you, two tickets to Paradise, it could be anywhere. It could be Hawaii. Yeah. It could be, you know, it could be anywhere. You know, it's, it's, it's a state of mind, so to speak, Frank. Well, yeah, and I think it's interesting, isn't it? Because... 
whether it's school, whether it's work, whether it's just however, whatever takes your time, you right. need to go find other time to right. to elevate yourself to right. almost re-energize when you when you go away, right? And then also the name that the word paradise rhymes very much with tonight. Yeah. So two tickets to paradise, pack your bears, release the night, because you know it's like that Billy Crystal movie, uh, Throw a Mama from a Train. A writer writes always. A writer always writes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, again, now, now we're back into your math world, right? No. <laughs> Another thing, I want to go to uh, from the Can't Hold Back record, uh, yeah. or over to it, if, as it were, right? I'm that not was sure a pretty what we're big doing. record for me, yeah. <laughs> um, I want to go back. Uh, really, Great song. Yeah. I mean, the reason I really actually did that song is because every member, everybody remembers, well, my experience in high school was always drinking beer under the bleachers and the all these kids would always get you the beer that was cheap on sale you never had a can opener and it was very very warm but i can remember in high school the high school dances and being in love with i found out the best way to date a cheerleader without being on the football team is to be the rock band in high school right right but i think the, the my favorite verse in that song was uh i recall hanging out on friday night the first slow dance, hoping that we get it right. That just that just really epitomizes a great song, and people really go back to that verse, and it's really special. Yeah, it's an interesting thing how we want to do that, even though even the lyrics you say you say you sing because uh, I'm I'm feeling so much older, but I can't go back. Right, you know, I know. isn't that the truth? Well, I'm younger than Bruce Springsteen, but I'm getting up there. <laughs> <laughs> Is that your goal to always be younger than Bruce Springsteen <laughs> and, and Rod Stewart? <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, you don't mind being older than anybody else. I don't really care, you know. I was reading also um, something that you wrote about getting beat up in high school, or well, maybe grade school. Well, well, that's actually you know everybody. Uh, it was like you know taking the train into Brooklyn. Yeah, you run into a lot of the gimme nickel kind of guys, so to speak. You know, but yeah. you know, I mean, I always grew up in New York City. I grew up in a in a mixed neighborhood. And, uh, you, you know, you got to learn how to hold your own, so yeah. to speak, you know. I remember when I was uh, four or five years old, I used to get beat up, and and uh, I was in, in the Astoria Projects. We were in the Projects, which was a project that was actually for GIs after World War II. And I would cry in front of my mother's window, which on the seventh floor, fourth window to the right. And after wow. a while, she was, you know, she had my two younger sisters after me, and she just stopped coming to the window. So, yeah. <laughs> You you grew up pretty fast growing up in New so York Eddie City. Eddie had to take care of himself. That's it. I just think uh, my wife's a teacher, and I just right. I just get tired of bullying. And I get t and I and it's how many people, especially musicians, how many how many times you you always felt on the outside, and those who wanted to make you feel like you were on the well, outside. Yeah, I've had a, I, I've had a couple of when I was younger, and I had long hair. The, you know, I ran into a couple of Mexican guys in a gang that really had my face for lunch. But uh, on the <laughs> other hand. Uh, I held my own pretty good. I took back. I took PAL boxing and PAL, so I, I knew I can. And my uncle used to box, so I, you know, I learned how to take care of myself. What, what's PAL? A uh, police athletic league. Oh, okay. Yeah. Is that why you think you want to become a cop, though? Well, I wanted to be a com cop actually. To uh, my brother was in Vietnam at the time, and I didn't really feel like going because he was in the DMZ zone. He was up there on Monkey Mine at Monkey Mountain during the Tet Offensive back in 1968. Wow. And I was very much against the war in Vietnam, and uh, I had a lot of friends of mine going over there, and uh, I joined the police department, and then I said to myself, God, I'm going to be in uniform for like my grumpy old man for 20 years. I said to myself, I should have joined the Marine Corps and gotten the whole thing over with. <laughs> then I quit the police department because it was just a little too militant for me, and I moved out to California. And uh, and that's when you went to school after? I went to school out okay. there and I went to junior college and transferred to UC Berkeley. Go Bears. Okay. And my mother and father never forgave me because I was about six credits away from graduating. Nice. But I got a record deal and I didn't care. <laughs> <laughs> record deal, six more credits. And I got a great lottery number in the draft, too, so that was good, too. I was well, like, I was wondering about that. I mean, there was no there was no joining the police force, so you wouldn't have to be... Um... Well, I had a, I had an occupational deferment, but... Uh, oh, really? You could, you could get that? Well, I was an occupational deferment because I worked on the police department. Oh, okay. And actually, I worked days instead of working around the clock like my old man because I took typing in high school because I got thrown out of shop class. Yeah. <laughs> Where it took you three years to make a salad bowl. I don't know if you know about it. But I was typing with an old girls <laughs> class. People, didn't, Guys didn't type that much in high school back then. Yeah. It was an old girls class, and the only other guy in my class was my league guitar player. 
Seriously? And then I wound up, when I went on a police bump, they funny. said, can anybody type? And I raised my hand, and I wound up typing the roll call. So I worked 8 to 4. I didn't work around the clock. Really? So I then I was working 8 to 4, so we kept the band alive at night. We were rocking and rolling. Then the mad band moved out to California, and they said, you know, let's come out and sing. And we got a record deal. Of course, we never got the record deal, but I did come out to California, and Got a, got arrested for harboring AWOLs because all my friends that were going to Vietnam didn't want to go. I said, well, you can always stay at my house. <laughs> did, did you really get arrested? Yeah. How did they deal? Because now they, they were draft. Well, draft dodger went to Canada, right? Right. No. So they were I'm AWOL? talking about draft dodgers that stayed in the States right, exactly. and, and hid from the feds and hid from the Army. You right, know? because they had a low draft number, right? Or whatever. Well, yeah, they got they drafted. Were, they were Craig, drafted. Craig Schofield, a good buddy of mine, played harmonica, another couple of singers. Yeah, yeah. And I lost a couple of friends over in Vietnam, too. You know, friends of mine from high school. You got to remember, I graduated from high school in 1967, which was the peak of the war. That had to be a weird time because... That was the peak of... Because, of, of, you know, there were so many demonstrations for peace, right? Right, yeah. Yet, you're worried about where your lottery number is going to be. And right. getting drafted, right? And going to a war that the country really didn't get behind. Well, I didn't really want to join the Coast Guard. I mean, if I was going to went to the service, I wanted to go thick and thin. I was going to join either the Army or yeah. the Marine Corps, right. like my brother. But uh, I was, you know, when I at the war was just, I was, I just wasn't into the war at all. I didn't think it was necessary. The North Vietnamese took over South Vietnam, and they seem to be doing fine over there. The economy is okay. They got mm. a thriving uh, tourist business, so you know yeah. maybe. That's the way the cards fell. Have you talked a lot about this with your brother? Well, my brother, he was, uh, he's gotten over it. He, re he became a, a deputy inspector on the police department. Okay. He's a very smart guy, but my father would say he's got no common sense at all. He <laughs> drinks like a fish. He's on a ver verge of becoming a diabetic, but he's, he's one hell of a big brother. A guy. If I wasn't two, fa two steps faster than my brother to this day, I don't think I'd be alive today, to tell you the truth. <laughs> Speaking of families and bullies, the, the thing that really still gets inside of me really um, a, a, in a weird place is the idea that more soldiers have committed suicide yeah. after the war than were killed during the Vietnam War. I know. And that, that's why I asked about your brother. It's kind of like, how, he how do pretty, you ever get that out of your He was pretty nuts when he came back. Actually, when he was over there, he was on sentry, and he accidentally killed a goat and a little girl. Mm. And he was, you know, he was in a stick of things. And what blew his mind is that the farmer wanted him to pay for the goat. Wow. And that kind of messed up his head. But he couldn't sleep for the first five years he was home. And we're doing a lot of work right now with the Intrepid Fallen Heroes Foundation, which is a foundation with these kids with these come back from uh, Afghanistan and Iraq with these horrible head traumas, yeah. bleeding from the ears and stuff like that. And uh, it's crazy. They have a, it's a nonprofit organization, and they built a facility with 120 beds in San Antonio in the early 2000s. They've raised over $2 million, and it's really great. And I run into a lot of these veterans and a lot of their parents, and we sell T-shirts, one more soldier coming home. And actually, we just got on iTunes with the song that I was very much involved in called One More Soldier Coming Home. Mm -hmm. It's a lot like that song, Big Bad John. Mm. Big, you know the guy that holds the mine up at the end. Yep. You know, when I, but it's really it's a true, it's kind of a true job. story yeah. about a kid that didn't make it back from say Iraq or Afghanistan. Mm. It's, uh, he comes back in a box, and it just makes people realize we have 150,000 people deployed over there, and 30,000 have, have been injured, and over 6,000 have given their lives gallantly and courageously. You know, f for this country. I I just hope we're past war. I mean, I know we're not. But I want to be closer to getting past it. Well, you better tell about that son of a bitch that's running her around. What he's thinking about? Because he does, you know. There's a lot of people out there that just can't stand Americans. There's the haves and the have-nots. I I can't understand a lot of that. And I believe in freedom of religion, but uh, I don't think the Muslims are very crazy about people that believe in. Jesus well, when you two are around the, um... I mean, I, I'm Hindus and Muslims and uh, all these wonderful religions. I think this country was really based on freedom of speech and definitely freedom of religion. Mm -hmm. I had nothing against Muslims at all. Yeah, well, yeah, and, and we, um, after 9-11, mm. which must have been a New Yorker and being yeah, a guy I, I in a the police of, force. I was going through a lot of funerals uh, after 9-11. A lot had a lot of guys that I knew from the fire department. I knew a couple of emergency service workers, a couple of ambulance drivers that went down, and about... Mm, Six or seven policemen, you know, young guys that were married, that had families, mm -hmm. and I still communicate with their families, actually. 
Yeah, I, I just think that when it comes to religion, there's always some extremists out there that can give the entire religion a bad name, no matter what it is. You know? I really, everybody does have the different beliefs, but uh, yeah. you can't really touch on religion in an interview. You'll get yourself in a lot of trouble. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't know. I talk about God a lot and because right. I think God sort of separates, is sort of separate from religion because religion can kind of muck up. People can muck up sure. God via right. religion, you know what I mean? Because there's a lot of people that I look at and go, wow, and they would never think about calling themselves religious, but maybe sure. spiritual. Well, spiritual is a good word for it, sure. You know? you know? But, I mean, you sent your kids to a Christian school, right? I kids sent my kids to, uh, actually, my wife and I had to get married. <laughs> we had enough name for those. She was kind of like Kurt Russell and Goldie Hawn. I think she was really crazy about marrying me. But once the kids started parochial school, Catholic school, and we had two different last names, well, we decided to tie the knot. Oh, that's, <laughs> and that's why we choose to get married. That's right. Well, that, that, that's the case, but, you know. <laughs> but we are happily married. I love my wife dearly. Uh, it's a good thing being married. How long have you been married, The then? cop said to me, why would you tell the phone to your wife? I said, officer, I was just trying to knock the knife out of her hand. <laughs> Grimshaw, anybody? Where's your drummer when we need him, huh? Right, sure. <laughs> well, let's go back into songs if we can. Uh, back into Can't, Can't Hold Back. Take Me Home Tonight, which was, of course, huge. But, yeah, it's a big But gathering uh, uh, Ronnie's... Ronnie Spector. Yes, sir. I was, all of a sudden, I'm going, Spector? That's... that's uh, Phil Spector's wife. No, yeah, right. no relation, <laughs> of course. But when you, uh, when you gathered up Ronnie Spector, was she like... Yeah, this might mean I step back into the well, business. You know what I tell you? She was dropped out of the business, and she married a Jewish kid that was a lawyer, Jonathan. And I called her up because the chorus was "Take Me Home Tonight," was the chorus. But the second it was a great song. It was a big hit, I think, yeah. because it actually had two choruses. It had the "Be My Little Baby," which was a big hit for uh, Ronnie Spe Spector and the Ronettes back in the early '60s, and it was. Uh, I called her up and I asked her if she wanted to come down, and so I said, "This is a tribute to you." It's this, the lyric is just like Ronnie sang. I said, the song is all about you. You got to come. I was originally going to use Martha Davis from the motels to oh, do yeah. it. But uh, getting Ronnie was a real treat for me. We've been very good friends ever since. That's nice. How about Bring on the Rain from that record? I, I love I, that tune. Yeah. I love that tune, too, because I, I, it's interesting to think that you want it to, that you want to sort of embrace that feeling. Well, yeah, I mean, California and a good life, I loved it. So Bring on the Rain was about, when I first moved out to California, I think it was in 68, 69, it rained. I thought we were going to get ready to build an ark, look for Noah and get two deer together, two giraffes, two a man. You know, it was super raining, but I, I did love the rain, and I just think that's a, that's one of my favorite songs on that record, by the way. Yeah. Uh, there's lines in there that uh, those sunny skies all look the same. Man, I'm looking for a change. I want some rain now. Right. Well, uh, you know, there was a, a very bad drought back in the... You know, I just... Uh, I love rain. I mean, I love it to falling down. I like to hear it coming down the chute. It's uh, it's just uh, thunderstorms. I, you know, I'm just a big rain freak, I guess, you know? Yeah. When you live in California, it only rains like two or three months a year. And it's right. usually in the middle of the winter and I'm on the road. So I never see it. <laughs> well, I love it when I'm just laying down and hearing the uh, yeah, just just hearing it's it like, rain. It's almost kind of like being close to the beach and hearing the, the waves pound, the surf pounding against the rocks. You know. Yeah, right. Could you hear it rain when you were a kid in New York on the seventh floor? Oh, sure, yeah, definitely. You know, when I was a kid, sure, you used to open the window. Well, you know, when it rains in New York, too, it also gets very humid in the summertime. Yeah, you know? that, yeah, that. the summer rains are great, and you know. Yeah. And I remember them opening up the fire the fire hydrants for the kids, you know. To, you oh, know really? Wow. Just like that movie Goodfellas. That's what it was like in New York City. Wow. I, I grew up in the country, and I just remember watching the rain come across the field, and I would, my mom would always go, Frank, you got to see the rain coming across the field. And I'm telling you, there's, yeah. there's nothing better than seeing the front edge of it. And Yeah, well, I actually grew, oh, up, cool. I grew up in New York City, but we had a little house in the mountains with an outhouse, no electricity, a wood-burning stove when I was a kid. Really? And uh, I remember a lot of just like remember when you used to get your pants all wet, getting get walking in the dew in the morning, right? Mm -hmm. The morning dew, you know. Yeah. So I know what it's like to live in the country. Ever, ever still feel like a stranger in a strange land? <laughs> well, that depends. I felt pretty much like a stranger when I was over there in Japan, but we I played over there at Budokan and uh, with with Santana, and I was very well received in Japan. I made some platinum artists over there, but. Uh, you know, you can feel like a stranger when you don't speak, when, when you get to a country where they don't really speak the language. Mm -hmm. But then I get up to the Canada, too, and, uh, you know, I could shrink them, but I used to love the beer in Canada. And, uh, you know, and I like, you know, I like about getting out of the country. 
you got a different currency, which is always fun, even though you don't know what you're doing with the <laughs> right. money. Take uh, it, whatever. People I'll are whatever. different. Uh, the cigarettes are different. The beer is different. The food is different. And when I go to Canada, I, I really feel like when I do shows up there, I really love it because I feel like I'm on vacation. And so did you write that song about being in another country? Or was it, uh, or was I, it that sort of idea that I don't, I don't feel at home even in this that, world? You know, I'll tell you, that, that whole thing, that whole song was... Uh, it's being around a lot of straight people is what it was about, you know. <laughs> to tell you the truth, I had long hair, and I was going back to my parents, and everybody around my parents, my, you know, everybody had short hair. My father was on the police department. My father was a cop, and I was, mm -hmm. I was the hippie communist there for a couple of years, you know. <laughs> That's a word from the 70s, for me anyway. So you quit drinking? Yes. How long ago? Uh, March 2nd, 2009. But who's counting? Uh, I guess. Well, I'm not really candy, but I just, you know, I just, uh, I never really drank excessively anyway, because it's really ripping off the, I wasn't like a Janis Joplin or a Jim, Jim Morrison, but it just got to the point where, you know, one beer wasn't enough after a while, you know, yeah, right. after work, I'd start knocking down the vodka and, you know, and then the fresh squeezed orange juice and the stolage nair and, yeah. you know, drinking like a, a, a Mick Jagger and stuff like that. It, it just gets to you. Then you start drinking. Next thing you know, you're looking for a line or you're a bump and, you know, the whole thing. One bad thing yeah. leads to another, you know. Did you have people saying, hey, take a look at yourself? Or oh, sure, you yeah. Yeah, I definitely had definitely, you know. I went to a, a place called Duffy's, which is up there in Calistoga. You know the Calistoga water? Well, they bottle it up there. They have this big geyser out of Calistoga. But, yeah, you know, I got, uh, you know, I've been in and out of a spiritual program for the last, uh, what, 25, 30 years. But uh, I finally just said, I just got to quit drinking completely, yeah. you know. Still smoking? Still smoking, unfortunately. Yeah. I quit for two months and went back. You know, I, I, the, fam the familiarity of it all, when I hit, I would, had no trouble quitting cigarettes at all. But as soon as I got back on the bus, the tour bus, and doing the interviews right. with people smoking around me, it's just I'm a creature. A tr I'm just a creature of habit, man. What are you going to do? Well, isn't it almost part of what you did when you and do when you're. Do well, you, you know, I started smoking when I was 13, 14 years old. I remember all that. I've been getting suspended for smoking in the bathroom and everything else, like in high yeah. school. I mean, I guess smoking when I was growing up it was peer, it was pretty much peer pressure, you know. Yeah. So I'll ask you, but I, I know you said I don't know if you really want to talk, but but in a spiritual program for twenty five years, what does well, that what does that kind of mean? In well, a, you know, it's like you know, you got a big book, and you, you know, you talk about people that done this and that, and you get sponsors and stuff like that. When I first quit getting loaded, I had a really very famous sponsor. I can't bring up his name, and he said to his wife, "You're not a kid, any money." He doesn't need a sponsor. He needs an exorcist. <laughs> so I was heavy into a lot of things. And people say to me, how did you OD? I said, hey, it was free. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'll say to you what I've said to a few other guys. What my dad would say to me is, do you know the money you're wasting? Right. Do you know all the money you're putting right down the drain? I know. Besides the health issues, right? right. I mean, but when you're making a lot of money, when you're making $1,000 a minute for a 75-minute show, which was what I was making in the old days, money was not really a problem. Yeah. And plus, people are always there to get you loaded for nothing, just for a couple of backstage passes, you know? Music business. And that is something, huh? It's crazy. Now my motto was a backstage pass is a pain in the ass. <laughs> Meet and greet. We always do meet and greet, so a good meet and greet is good because you know, got people come down and see your show, and they, you know, I've got a lot of great fans out there. And the worst, thing, you know, you don't want to be considered, oh, that Eddie Money's a shitty tipper, or I met Eddie Money, he treated my wife like crap. I met Kid Rock one time, and he, I thought he was the biggest jerk in the world, but he was so nice to my kids that mm. I, I changed my mind about the nice. guy, you know. <laughs> yeah, I've, hey, you know what? It's all about the day that we meet somebody, right, isn't sure. it? Yeah, and I it's guess. funny because not that you have to. Um, corral your image and make sure that you're one person out there but there's something about just being a little bit up and a little bit uh, grateful well, i tell you what's happening these days is i always tease my audience i always say like sometimes i'm sorry i drank that quarter vodka i'll try to give you a good show and next thing i know it was all over the internet on it and the uh, what on youtube oh really and I said, I was just teasing with my audience. It's not, and I get phone calls from my mother-in-law, and you drink, is he drinking again? Oh, I hope he's not, you know, but I'm going, whoa, you got to watch your P's and Q's out there. But you know what's funny? The world about, is not a, it's yeah. not a private place for you anymore. If you, what's funny about it for me, though, is that just say, fill in blank of alcohol name, people cheer. 
<laughs> it's almost like this thing. It's like, why? Why? It's like throwing out the F bomb, too. It's like, just yeah. throw it out there and people go, ah! I know. Well, the more you drink, the better I sound, I guess. So, <laughs> a lot of people knocking down the bevies at any money show. I got to tell you that right now. Well, then, uh, I've driven more tip than your one, waiters and waitresses. I've driven more than one couple home in the last five years. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Well, I hope it's to a good place and not to the place, as I will segue into, we should be sleeping. Oh, sure. How about that? Nice one, huh? Well, we should be sleeping and uh, I'll get by. I wrote a lot of songs about staying up all night because that's what I was doing. I was staying up all night. You know? But were you arguing? I mean, were you in a, no, in a no, tussle no. with, with no, by, by, the, the We should be sleeping is about, you know, just not sleeping. You know, you know, you sleep maybe three hours every four days, and you know, you, of course, you're only twenty seven, twenty eight years old, and your body's in great shape and stuff like that. But we should be sleeping. Is <laughs> about what I should have been done. Well, I should have been sleeping. <laughs> well, I think about it whether it's pillow time where I'm walking or actually getting up and, and, and working. But it, you know, just that line that you have is I'm going to change at all the things that were wrong. Right. Whether that means the relationship, whether that means work, whether right. that means whatever. Those are those deeper thoughts that we right. get to right. when we quote unquote should be sleeping. <laughs> so you captured it. Yeah, right. You captured it right there. So the reason you probably drank with all that money is because of baby hold on, right? <laughs> that's what no, that's reason, what put all that uh Well, you know what was a vicious cycle is what I do. I would drink a lot of booze and then I'd get start get too drunk and then I would probably, you know, do something to bring me up, like either whether it be a Benny's truck stock Bemmies or a cocaine and uh next thing you know is you're drunk and then you're too loaded then you're too high and too nervous from the from the amphetamines and then you you start drinking again and before you know it at the end of the night you realize you spent over two hundred dollars and you're completely sober. <laughs> you know? Dude. You could take an SAT test at the end of the night. It just didn't make sense. So what was the longest you stayed up? No, I don't think when you know, when you stay up for three or four days, you you know, it's kinda like that movie uh The Sixth Sense. Whoosh, you yeah. see, you feel people behind you, or you see a shadow. It's pretty yeah, freaky right. when you're up for three or four days. Right? And what happens then? You just crash for like eighteen hours or I something. I would have ridiculous. to say you crash for as long as you can possibly crash for. I don't know, but yeah, I think a lack of sleep is not a very good thing. I don't recommend it. Now sometimes I'm traveling so much that I'm, you know, I'm getting up, I'm doing shows late, and I'm going at one thirty in the morning. I'm getting off, and then I got to catch like a, I got to be at the airport at five thirty, right. and I'm not snowing on anything. <laughs> and I got to go to work. So what do you do? <laughs> you try to sleep on the plane, or you try to get a couple of here, hours here and there. But I have a hard time sleeping during the daytime. Why do you think? Uh, why do you think songs like "Baby Hold On" connected with so many people? Is it is it that we're always begging for that chance at someone? Well, I had a, I had a buddy of mine that was a critic. His name was Joe. Sullivan. He was a big critic in the San Francisco Chronicle for years. He's retired now, like most of my friends. And he <laughs> said that Baby Hold On really represented the American male inadequacies. I want, I want, I don't have, gimme, gimme, gimme. <laughs> baby Hold On with me, whatever will be with me, the future is us. Just, baby, what's these things you've been saying about me behind my back? Is it true you think you better life? It's also, it was a song about, mm -hmm. I wrote that song about that, that the girl I told you that I was dating in college. Because her mother was trying to get rid of me to the how to dump me, and I wanted her to baby hold on to me, you know. Uh, Peace in Our Time is, I thought, was a pretty powerful song. That was a very powerful song. Actually, we were supposed to go over that song, would have been an international sensation. Yeah. Uh, when the Berlin Wall was coming down, they wanted me to go over and do this song in, wow. I think, Berlin. And something came up, and we did one on the road with Steve Miller or Fleetwood Mac or something. But I always regret the fact that we didn't do an international video on that song. It was really a great song. It, it, it's a song n way more than just a relationship, right? Yeah, that song is about the world, you know? Never yeah. gonna, you know, never. Yeah, it's a great tune. It really is. How strong is love supposed to be surrounded by music? You know, it's really, it's a very, it's a very philosophical song. It's, it, it's one of my deeper tunes. Yeah, yeah. What, what, what else do you think is one of your deeper tunes? I don't really know. Okay, then I'll tell, you what, then I'll tell you what they were. Okay, you tell How me. How about what that song? <laughs> yeah. I, I thought Life for the Taking was. It's a great tune. I Seriously, think, that I is. I think it's probably one of my, uh, maybe one of the best songs I've ever penned. I mean, when you want, an old man wants to look me in, in the eye. That actually happened. I was on the subway, and, and an old man, you know, just looking at me and I, like, you can walk, and he had a cane, and he was moving around real slow, and he looked at me like, you got the world by the tail, kid, you know? You got the world it. by the tail. I mean, that song was from personal experience. 
So sometimes do you... And the big boys used to beat me up a bit. That was my growing up in New York City. Same yeah. thing, you know. Do you think sometimes you wrote them to yourself? Yes. Yeah. I think you write a lot of songs, but you always write songs that, you know, that are similar situations that people can relate to. I mean, who hasn't gotten... I'm sure you've gotten fights in high school, right? Yeah. We all yeah. did. It's something that you, you probably would regret. I remember I was in... I had, it was the longest fight in my high school history. It lasted for seven hours. <laughs> Dude. It was from 3 o'clock in the afternoon until 9.30 at night. What the? And the guy kicked my ass, and I still went to school the next day with two black eyes. You're not missing school, Eddie. <laughs> <laughs> no, you didn't want to show up. You won't. You, just, you wanted to show up because, you know, hey, you, I might be beat up, but I'm still here. We became good friends anyway. I'll say that this is uh, your most religious song, Walk on Water. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will say that because I thought it was funny because it's just sort of that that yeah. cliche that's uh, that well, is the yeah, title. Yeah, they, they, they don't walk on water. Actually, that was written. That wasn't written by me. It was written by Jesse Holmes, a good buddy of mine. Oh, okay. And it was it was a big hit for me. I know. I'm not really crazy about the song because I don't like singing na 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 na. It's very <laughs> silly, but it was a big hit for me. And since mm. people really got very familiar with the song and they appreciate the song, I, I put it in the set. Now, I will go back to a song that I thought had a pretty cool message, too. It was Looking Through the Eyes of a Child. Oh, that's great, too. That I mean, was... yeah, I mean, the, the, there's a great lyric in there of a Send Me a Wise Man or a book about love. Yeah. But of the bacon, I've been taking. Yeah, I, that was great, too. And that was actually, ter that was given to me by Columbia Records. Mm. And I thought it was going to be a single, and it never was. I don't know what happened. I thought that was a great song. I thought it would have been a great single. That's why I did it, but... Apparently the uh, label thought differently than I you think. think it's a, you think it's a song about searching for direction? Yes, I do. In life? I think so. It's like one of those lost soul songs that a lot of young people feel like. You know, a lot of my, a lot of my songs are like for, for kids that are 18 and 19. You're just getting out of the house or, you, you yeah. know, young couples that are just starting out. I mean, how many people can you tell me that lived on powder, powdered milk and Chef Boyardee ravioli going to school? Come on. <laughs> hey, do you remember uh, Space Food Sticks? Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah. That was a meal for us sometimes. I know. I'd say. And there was a time that I was on food stamps and, you know, welfare and all that other stuff. But, you know, I could never tell my parents that. But that was the case. I was also the president of my foods conspiracy. I was a hippie back in the 60s. I was in, the, you know, students for a democratic society. I was in the Youth International Party with Jerry Rubin and A.B. Hoffman. Isn't, there, isn't it funny that there's something in a lot of us that what we think we need to say? Right. You know, instead of just talking, you and me talking. Right. I was a radical. Table. I was definitely a radical back in the late yeah. 60s and early 70s. Hey, I thought a song that, that's maybe an anthem for 2011, 2010, or at least the last couple of years right. is Can't Keep a Good Man Down. That's a great tune. I Thank mean, you. seriously, throw that on because uh. there are times when life has taken its toll on you and you just right. want to sort of... Well, I wrote that Can't Keep a Good Man Down, actually, because when I first moved out to California, my parents more or less disowned me for quitting the police department, and uh, I was in a rock band, and everybody was living with their parents at home and had gas in the car and dinner on the table and... You know, right, they, yeah. they were living like kings. If baby take your rich boy, he can stay in my home all day. He's got so much money, he's got nothing to say. I'm on the streets and I cover this whole town. Ain't got no money, but you can't keep me down, you know. It's about being broke and young. I'm sure a lot of people can relate to that. And I and I admit I'd rather fight than quit because I think that's... Right, exactly. Because I think there's too many people right now that are that are teetering. The, the economy is very, very bad right now. They say it's 10%. 12%. I think it's closer to 19%. I don't know what's happening with the world. I know ticket sales are really a, a, on a decline, but, you know, you just do everything you can. There's a lot of great Eddie Money fans out there, and, I mean, I did one show last night that Brett Michaels did a show there like three or four days before and, and drew very little people, and Brett Michaels is a big star. And we kind of basically... Some poison. Yeah, and we kind of basically packed the place, and it made me really feel good about... The longevity that I had, and I've had a lot of, I've had about, what, 11 or 12 songs in the top top 100, top 40? That's a, that's a lot of tunes. Well, I read on Wikipedia, because I didn't keep track of your record sales, 28 million records. My, <laughs> no, I mean. I, I should have saved the money, who knew, huh? <laughs> I'm going to go back into my dad, what were you doing? <laughs> 28 million records, dude. Well, yeah, that, I, that's unheard of anymore. I had, I had a major anymore. drug overdose, and I killed the sciatic nerve in my left leg because I went into a, a semi-catatonic state, and yet my nerves weren't twitching. So I killed the sciatic nerve in my left leg, which is the longest nerve in your body, 
and it took like a year to grow back. So I wasn't walking around for a whole year, which is why I wrote that song, Keep My Motor Running, about the old lady. Well, you can sell 28 million records and still not be happy, can't you? Can't you? I guess so. Happiness is the state of mind. I'm happy because, you know, I'm not sick today. I don't have cancer. And, uh, I'm, you know, I just got a phone call from my... I hate to do that old cardiovascular work and stuff like that. The older you get, you know, the day you got to really exercise more. And I haven't exercised, but I can't stand it. So you have to really decide you're going to do it? I got to push myself, yeah. yeah. Hey, well, then welcome to the human race. I right? hate it. Don't you hate it? It was a lot easier. I loved it when I was younger. I didn't have to exercise to save my life. Now I tell my wife I love this. She says, get off me. <laughs> Again, where's, his, where's your drummer when we need him? <laughs> I'll say just out loud because I, I don't like to say it, but I, I think my favorite song is My Friends, My Friends. I just, oh, what a, a I, song. I just think that that's why we're here is to be in community Well, because we're all talking about, talking about my T-shirts and how, yeah. how they used to fit me. I mean, if that, <laughs> if that line doesn't make sense, it doesn't, you know? Yeah, and uh, it's it's really a great tune, and we do that song live a lot. It's not really in the set right now because yeah. we're doing this Christmas Christmas show, but it's it's a great. I, I like to end the night with that song. Well, yeah. Do you think? Yeah, I mean, is that because that's how important friends are to yeah, you? Yeah, I mean, it really is. I mean, I lost a lot of friends. You know, I have friends that got in car wrecks, friends that no deed on drugs, friends that went to Vietnam. You know, mm -hmm. friends that just off up and they're gone close friends too i'm sure you've got three or four friends that aren't sure. here anymore that you'll sure. never forget right yeah you right know? yeah or, or just not in the vicinity right right and if it weren't for like ben or dying of cancer from the cause he was he was a good buddy of mine was I, he oh I, and then i still talk to his mother she still comes to shows every once in a while oh really yeah was he a good soul great guy really great guy um i think i'm in love from that same no control <laughs> record feeling i mean how is it how is it that when we are feeling love, life is alive? Right. Isn't it? Especially if you think you're in love and your life's looking up. Yeah. That was a very, very up positive song. I wrote that song actually with a guy named Randy Oda. That was a Japanese friend of mine. He lived in Berkeley, California, Northern California. And uh, he never really made it in the States. But uh, he did that record actually in Japan. He, he cut it himself. Oh, did he? He was a big hit over there. Yeah. And when I was over in Japan, that was one of their favorite songs I did think of love. Of course, they, it helped out because Japanese people stick it together. And the co-writer was Randy Oda, so I was a big hit over there. <laughs> you know what's funny to me is I think there's always something about great about when you think you're in love with somebody new. But when you're re-energized, like even with my wife, right. with, and when, you're, when, there's, when, when there's that time that you go, God, isn't love just fantastic? I know. F fighting sucks, but it sure is a lot of fun making up. <laughs> So did your dad tell you it's a hard life? Uh, it's a hard life. It's actually, I wrote that song after the drug overdose when I actually couldn't. I was using a walker to write the No Control album with them. Tom Dowd, who was a great producer. I mean, he did me, he did the Omni Brothers, he did Rod Stewart. Mm -hmm. I mean, he did Patty Page. How much is that dog in the window? I'm talking about this guy. Wow. Tom, he was, Tom My Dowd. parents had that on a 78 record. Yeah, I know. Well, Tom Dowd was really a, a very wise and professional man and uh, when I made the No Control album I had to use a walker to get from my bedroom to the music room to make the record because you know, like, yeah, killed the sciatic nerve in my left leg yeah. and I had a lot of money in the bank because I was making a thousand dollars a minute for a 75 minute show but a drug overdose was considered like a suicide attempt and the insurance company didn't pay for anything oh really so it cost me three million dollars <laughs> and all my money <laughs> Well, then it's a hard life living on your it's own. It's a hard life. Thank you. It was no wonder I wrote that song. <laughs> <laughs> because you're short $3 million. Right. Actually, I just refinished Cutting Hard Life with uh, Vince Gill. Oh, really? Did a country version of it. It's really good. Oh, on, on his new record? No, we're going to be putting it out, calling it Eddie Money is Shot at Country. Oh, really? I got my hands with a couple of pies out there, you know? Hey, nice. Nice. No control? Just sort of searching for yourself in that? Uh, no was control. that kind of around the drug drug overdose too, maybe? Shit, well, they took me to the hospital. I swear I wasn't going to go. My blood was running too much too high. Yeah. My heart was... That song was about the uh, about the drug overdose. Yeah. It's just like take a little bit. It's, he says I'm okay. He says I might be all right. I lose control. I lose control. It keeps me up all night. Yeah, the yeah. devil, yeah. The devil in my ass. Look in the mirror. <laughs> yeah, isn't it funny when you look in the mirror and you really don't like what you see, but you don't know how to change that, dude? Yeah, that can happen. 
It'll and you kept mo- and you kept and you kept dabbling in it, right? Even after that, sure. Because you're yeah, you're you're invincible. You're I, at any freaking money. Right. Just what they said about Bill Graham when he flew in that helicopter that night and got himself killed. Yeah, you know, it's crazy. You, know, you get so big and so famous, you think nothing's going to happen to you. You know. Well, you're going to be passing by the graveyard. That's me segueing again. That's the song I actually wrote about John Belushi. Mm. I got to meet John. We were working Saturday Night Live in New York, and we became friends. And he was a nasty drunk. It was always any money, but it was, when, it was, when he was drinking, it was Mahoney. And I, he was always looking at a cop, and he used to stay at the Chateau Marmont out there with me. And uh, I really liked John. He was he was he was a fun guy, kind of a lost soul late at night, but he was a fun yeah, guy. Yeah, I wondered about that. And I wrote that song called Bury Me Deep in a Piano Box, Make Sure It's Lighting with the Lids Fading Up, because he was heavy. Yeah. And they didn't bury him in a piano box, but I right. just kind of, what is it called, the simile? Is that what I'm talking about? Or is it a metaphor? I don't know. It's one of those. What, 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 what happens with a guy like that? Is he, is he just got so much going on inside his brain that he tries to calm it down with, with drinking and drugs? Or, you know or is how he, it is, man. You do drugs because you want to stay up late at night and you're famous and everybody loves you. <laughs> so right. would you guys make sure you guys went into um, various bars just to be recognized? No. No, when I party with John, we used to party in bathrooms and not in, you know, neither one of us was supposed to be getting loaded. <laughs> so it was always in a dark corner in the back of a bathroom somewhere, you know? So how close was... But then again, he was into a lot of, you know, I didn't realize he was actually shooting heroin, you know? I was I never stuck a needle in my arm in my life, you know? Yeah, but once you get to a certain point, right, you've got, quote-unquote, no control. I wouldn't, yeah, that's no control, but i got to tell you, you know, I, I deadly fear... Uh, Definitely, for, you know, when I was a little kid, I used to hate the polio shots, and I, I just have a fear of needles. I can't stand. Ooh, even watching people shoot up, it just drives me crazy. I can't, I can't be around that. So, is this all going to be part of this uh, this musical you're putting together about your life? Uh yeah, the musical. Actually, I wrote the musical, and I wrote a bunch of Broadway songs for the musical, but they were looking more or less like a jukebox uh, musical. So they went back and they used a lot of the songs that I wrote from uh, from my career. When did you have this inspiration that you thought, hey, uh, musical? Well, actually, when I saw Jersey Boys, and I met Frankie Valli, and when I realized that Frankie Valli lost his daughter to a drug overdose, I thought it was a mm. great play, and the, com- the camaraderie between the, the four seasons reminded me very much of me and my first band, The Grapes of Wrath, the band that I had in high school and, and my first couple of years of college. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking about him, you know, with his daughter OD and a dying. I said, well, man, I had a major drug overdose, and I survived it. And the biggest record I ever made was actually No Control. That was my most famous album. And the whole album is about, you know, don't do this. You don't have to be rich mm-hmm. or famous to get drunk and drive your car off a bridge or do something that you don't know what you're doing, and you wake up dead in the morning. And look at all these old kids, these kids ODing on alcohol, and the parents are completely stunned. How could my son be dead? Alcoholic poisoning, yeah. you know? Is that what Running Away is about then? Facing up to your problems? Running Away was actually a song about, uh, I had a little girl that I was very deeply involved with from San Antonio, Texas. And uh, she was in the downers and stuff like that. And we had a relationship. We were both very, very young. And uh, she just didn't work out, you know, the yeah. song was late at night and I still can't sleep, my body's tired but my thoughts are running deep, I think I know what you're going through, I kind of feel the same way too, it's a great song, it's actually about, it's another song I guess about growing up, you know, yeah. about, you know, severing a very important relationship that you thought was going to last forever. I, th- I thought Take a Little Bit is about living life and growing Take up. Take a and... Little Bit was also about, <laughs> I wrote so many, had so many songs about that uh the overdose, which they called in those days, were very politely they called it the accident. <laughs> yeah, take a little the bit. Severe was a, accident. Take a little bit was a great song. It was a great video too. That was a great song also. Yeah, what's the song that you thought was going to be the monster that just never made it? Ah, uh, ba 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 be ba bo. Was there one? There was always there was a couple of songs that I thought were going to uh, make it that didn't make it. Uh, so called, uh, I can see the love in your eyes. Which they that they shot a video of it. Mm. I thought that was going to be get Ginger Baker was actually played the uh, he was in the video we, we, we shot mm. it. I was a big show. You know, you always think you, 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 your song's going to make it. You know, you're 38 with a bullet and you're all excited. The next thing you know, like you're 47 with an anchor. It's all part of the business. You know, <laughs> nobody stays on top forever. Well, is that what happens when you're uh, 47 years of age? 
does the anchor just sort of tie around your ankles and nobody starts? <laughs> I have no idea. I've had a very crazy life. I'm very lucky that the guy upstairs has kept me around so I can entertain people. Because that's what's in your blood, right? That's it, buddy. Man, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you taking this time. My pleasure, buddy. This is I a good, appreciate that this is very a good much. Thing. Keep, uh, keep the money rolling in, right? And the ro- money rolling on. My friends call me Freddie Food Stamps. Because <laughs> <laughs> you can't stop? Right. But thank you for a great interview. And if you, everybody, uh, if you want to help out some wonderful people, just go to the Intrepid Fallen Hero Fund, mm-hmm. eddiemoney.com, and download the video for a dollar and help out these poor kids coming back with these head trauma injuries. 